Step three of our five steps of hypothesis testing is to select a criterion for significance. Well, you may be wondering when and where and how do we choose one of these criterion for statistical significance? I'm gonna explain all three of them to you, each with its own little story about how we would do the interpretation. And then I'm gonna show you how essentially all three of them are going to give us the same answer. Our first approach to placing our bets before the horses run is to use hypothesis testing in which we strictly adhere to a predetermined cutoff score or critical value. The critical value, also known as the level of significance, is the fence that we use to determine whether a test statistic is significant. Now, typically, we'll look up this critical value in some kind of statistical table. And we will have different tables for each new type of test that we learn. The critical value is based on a level of significance, typically 0.05. Therefore, the level of significance sets your critical region. The critical region, or the region of rejection, demarcates means that are so different, so far away from the population mean, that only less than 5% of the time would we randomly select a sample with that mean if the null hypothesis was true. Because this outcome is so unlikely, we reject the contention that the null hypothesis is true. Remember the region of rejection. And we accept that the means are statistically significantly different. Where that 5% of scores goes depends on whether you choose a directional or a non-directional alternative hypothesis. If you choose a one-tailed test, your 5% is going to be on only one end of the bell curve. If you choose a two-tailed test, your 5% is going to be divided equally between the two ends, or 2.5% in either end of the curve. So as I show you these beautiful normal curves and talk about 5% in one tail or 2.5% in both tails, it's easy to lose track of just how small these regions really are. It's much easier to see with a linear model. This stick is 32 inches long, and this black region on the end represents 5% of the total length. If I were to lay this on the table and then flip a coin aiming at the mean, how likely would it be to land all the way out in this region just by chance? And if you used a two-tailed test, these regions are even smaller. It would be highly unlikely for the coin to land in one of these extreme regions, especially if you were aiming for the middle. Unless, of course, you flipped 20 coins, and then we could be more confident that just by random chance, at least one of them would land out in these extreme regions. Now, interpreting critical values using hypothesis testing relies on a very strict criterion. So let me illustrate this in a slightly different way. Imagine that you come to visit us here in the Ozarks. And by way of introducing you to authentic rural Ozark culture, we offer to take you cow tipping. What is cow tipping, you ask? You've never heard of cow tipping? You're in for a real treat. What we propose to do is sneak out late one night to a farmer's field. And in this field are cows. And of course, there are fences around this field. I'll just represent the two side fences for now. These are the ones that matter most for our interpretation. In this field, the cows are sleeping. Cows can sleep standing up. And our plan is to jump over the fence, sneak up on a sleeping cow, and try to push it over. Don't do this. Please, don't, don't do cow tipping. Uh, cows are very large animals, and they are not easy to sneak up on. And they are highly resistant to tipping. So please, don't harass the cows. But if you would like a different example of this same idea, watch the movie Cars. 
In that movie, there's a scene where Mater the tow truck takes Lightning McQueen tractor tipping. Same idea. They sneak into a field, they sneak up on a sleeping tractor, they scare the sleeping tractor, it tips over backwards, they think it's great fun. Until they wake up a very ill-tempered combine that chases them through the field. Let's say something like that happened with our cow tipping example. We jump over the fence and we sneak up on this sleeping cow and try to push it over only to discover that this is not a cow, this is a bull. And that bull is fit to be tied because bulls don't like to be awakened from sleep any more than you do, especially by knuckleheads jumping over fences and disturbing their beauty rest trying to push them over. This bull is angry and this bull is going to chase us. Well, now we have to escape the bull, but no matter where we run in the field, we are still inside the fence with the bull. Whether we're right in the middle of the field or whether we're right up next to the fence, we're not safe until we get over the fence. Now, once we're over the fence, we don't have to be a hundred yards away back at the pickup truck. As long as we're over the fence, we're safe. Inside the fence, we're in danger from the bull. Outside the fence, we're safe. The only thing that matters is which side of the fence we are on. The analogy here is how we're going to treat these critical values. So let me add two more details. In hypothesis testing, the cutoff scores are strictly defined. If we do a t-test and we find that our test value is not quite in the critical region, it is almost statistically significant, it's still non-significant. There's no such thing as almost significant or more significant. It is either significant or it's not. If your test value is inside the fence, P greater than 0.05, it does not matter how close you get to the fence, you're still non-significant. However, if at any time you can get over the fence, P less than 0.05, you have now crossed into the critical region and you are significant. Now you may protest, that doesn't seem quite fair. You mean that a p-value of 0.049 is significant, but a 0.052 is not significant, and p-values of 0.0001 are not more significant than 0.05? If you are doing hypothesis testing, then the answer is we're going to stick to this very strict criteria for statistical significance. P must be less than 0.05 or equal to 0.05 to be statistically significant. However, there is another way. We could interpret p-values differently as evidence against the null hypothesis using significance testing. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Before I do, however, let me say a few words about how we interpret a one-tailed test. In this example, you see dotted lines that indicate where the critical value for a two-tailed test would be. However, we are doing a one-tailed test to the right, where our critical value would be a mean of 9.8. The test value is a mean of 4.23, which would be over the left fence for a two-tailed test. But we are not doing a two-tailed test. We are doing a one-tailed test to the right. For a one-tailed test, the change in the mean must be in the direction predicted in order to be significant. Changes to the left don't count. This drug was supposed to increase alertness, but instead it decreased alertness. This test is non-significant. For a one-tailed test, the change must be in the predicted direction. A second way to place our bets, selecting a criterion for significance, is by looking at probabilities using significance testing. In this case, we compute probabilities as evidence against the null hypothesis. The probability value, or p-value, is the probability of finding a given test statistic if the null hypothesis is true. 
If there truly is no difference between these means, how likely is it that we would randomly select a sample with this mean purely by chance? Alpha is the level of significance, typically 0.05 or 5%. There are other options, however. The most common level of significance is 0.05, especially in scientific and consumer research. In medical research, where quality matters more, we may tighten up the significance criteria to 0.01 or 1%. Political polling often uses a 0.10 or 10% level because the consequences are not as dire if they're wrong. And they can use smaller sample sizes given the less restrictive confidence interval. For most of the tests that we will do in this course, it's safe to assume that we are using an alpha of 0.05 and a two-tailed test. As an aid to interpreting p-values, remember that the total proportion of scores underneath the curve equals 1. 100% of the scores are under the normal curve. Put that in terms of a dollar, which is 100 cents. Therefore, 0.05 or 5% would be equivalent to a nickel. Significant probabilities are less than a nickel. If the probability given in your stat software is 0.32, make it 32 cents, which is greater than a nickel, p greater than 0.05, not significant. If the significance value is 0.02, make it 2 cents, which is less than a nickel, p less than 0.05, significant. If the significance value is 0 0.000, make it 0 cents, which is less than a nickel, p less than 0.05, but report it as p less than 0 0.001. In fact, you should never report a probability as 0. To do so would suggest that the probability is a true 0 or impossible. This probability is not impossible, it's just very small it's highly unlikely. Report small probabilities as p less than 0 0.001. Following the advice of Ronald Fisher, you would interpret your p-values as levels of evidence against the null hypothesis. If the p-value is less than 0 0.01, that is very strong evidence against the null hypothesis. P-values between 0 0.01 and 0 0.05 are strong evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. P-values between 0 0.05 and 0 0.10 are weak evidence against the null hypothesis, or supporting the alternative. And P-values greater than 0 0.10 are insufficient evidence suggesting that we should retain the null hypothesis. This XKCD comic presents a humorous take on interpreting p-values, ranging from highly significant to on the edge of significance to, oh crap, redo the calculations if the value is precisely 0 0.05, to suggestive of significance, and when everything goes pear-shaped, hey, look at this interesting subgroup analysis. And we all know from that previous comic about jelly beans that when you have to start dicing the data set into smaller and smaller portions, frantically searching for something that could be statistically significant, the rest of us have reason to be suspicious. Some researchers still adhere to a very strict criterion using hypothesis testing. This idea comes from Jersey Neyman and Egan Pearson. Now this is most appropriate when you're doing extensive testing using multiple hypothesis tests and it's very important that you control your error rate. At other times, researchers will use the approach of Ronald Fisher's significance testing, where the p-values report a level of evidence against the null hypothesis. This is most appropriate when you're doing single comparisons, a single test, or you have small sample sizes, or perhaps you're doing some kind of exploratory research where you're simply looking for promising directions for future research. And in this case, 0 0.05 provides exactly the same evidence against the null hypothesis as 0 0.052 or 0 0.048. All of those fluctuations around 0 0.05 are simply reflecting random error and sample size. 
the underlying effect size that you're measuring is exactly the same. A third way to place your bets on significance testing is using confidence testing, in which we establish a range of numbers to see whether another value is included or excluded from that range. We're going to throw a party. Now, the weird thing about this party is we can't invite individuals. We can only invite groups. So we could invite everyone in the freshman class, or we can invite everyone on the basketball team, or everyone in the glee club. But we can't invite specific individuals. You have just gone through a breakup. You'd like to come to the party, but if your ex is going to be on the guest list, you're not coming. I tell you that we're going to invite all of the seniors. And you think, hmm, my ex is a senior, he's included on the guest list, not coming. Or I say that we will invite all of the males in the class. And you say, my ex is a male, he's included on the guest list, I'm not coming. If I say we're going to invite only people who are in the honor society, you say, oh, my ex, not in the honor society. He's excluded from the guest list, therefore, I'm going to come to the party. In this example, the guest list is the 95% confidence interval. And the thing that we want to exclude is the null hypothesis value. Statistical significance is good news. Your X is not on the guest list. Your null hypothesis value is not in that confidence interval. There are two ways that we can write a null hypothesis. One is to specify that a mean will be a certain value, one that is not different from the population. And the other is that the difference between two means is zero. Well, that's the same thing, you say. Well, correct. But in the first case, our null hypothesis might be that mu equals 50, or some other specific population value. But in the second case, we might say that the mean difference, mu1 minus mu2, equals zero. Now, we learned from estimating intervals that the 95% confidence interval around a mean is two values between which the mean will fall 95% of the time. For example, we might specify in the null hypothesis that mu equals 36. If the 95% confidence interval around the mean excludes 36, the test is significant. Good news. But if the null hypothesis specified mu equals 34, then the 95% confidence interval around the mean includes the null hypothesis value. Bad news. Your X is coming to the party. We can use this same strategy when we hypothesize that the difference between two means is zero. A mean difference is mean one minus mean two. If the 95% confidence interval around the mean difference, two values between which the mean difference will fall 95% of the time, includes zero, then bad news, not significant. You can see this in a graph. In this case, the confidence interval around the mean difference for the food reward group is shaded in gray. The mean for the clicker training group is in the gray interval. It is included in the confidence interval. But if the 95% confidence interval around the mean difference excludes zero, then you're golden. The test is significant. The mean for the writing group is not within the shaded confidence interval for the math group. The confidence interval is the width of the bars around the mean. The mean is represented by a single dot. It is important to note that these three ways of interpreting significance will always agree with each other. There will never be a time when one says significant and another says non-significant. They will always tell you the same story because fundamentally, they're all based on the same values. This is some output from SPSS for an independent samples t-test. Before we began, we looked up the critical value for 14 degrees of freedom, and it was positive or negative 2.145. However, the test value 
was 1.587, which is not in the critical region. It does not exceed the critical value. The p-value is 0.135 or 13 cents, which is more than a nickel, greater than 0.05. The lower level for the 95% confidence interval around the mean difference is negative 0.44, and the upper limit is positive 2.9. One is negative, the other is positive. That mean difference crosses zero. All of these tell us the same thing. The test value is not in the critical region, the P is greater than 0.05, the confidence interval includes zero, this test is non-significant. This is some output from SPSS for a repeated measures test. This time the critical value is positive or negative 2.365, but the t-test is 2.8. That exceeds the critical value. The p-value is 0 0.028, or 2 cents, less than a nickel, p less than 0.05. Both the lower limit and the upper limit of the 95% confidence interval around the mean difference are positive. They do not cross zero. So here, this test value is in the critical region. P is less than 0.05. The confidence interval excludes zero. So your X is excluded and you can come to the party. This test is statistically significant. When we have completed these first three steps of hypothesis testing, we are finally ready to run our statistics, which is what we're going to do in step four of this introduction to hypothesis testing.